Okay, so good evening, everyone. So a warm welcome from my side. I'm Oliver, and I'm one of the project leads of the Illegal Wildlife Trade Team from Generation Climate Europe. And I'm very happy to welcome you all here. I see we are coming from many different countries, India, Turkey, Kenya, um, the Netherlands, Germany. So a very diverse field today. It's very exciting to have so many different people here um, being interested in this topic. So as you might have guessed or noticed, um, our topic today is to, um, tackling online wildlife trafficking and basically how does youth become a cyber spotter. Um, this webinar is run by Generation Climate Europe. So for those of you who don't know Generation Climate Europe, um, we are basically the largest coalition of youth-led networks bringing together 800, uh, 400, uh, 381 national organizations across um, 46 countries in Europe. And we advocate on mainly climate and environmental issues at a European level. And we basically aim to provide a platform for the youth to advocate for a just and green transition in Europe. Um, and just basically Generation Climate Europe has different topics they work on, such as um, circular economy, climate, and then obviously biodiversity. And within the biodiversity um, working group, there are three projects. Um, one of which is illegal wildlife trade. Um, so our project, basically, we were launched in March 2022. And our aim was basically or still is to raise awareness among young Europeans on wildlife trafficking in the EU, um, the environmental impacts that has and the regulations and gaps in implementations and enforcement. Um, so far, we had a couple of projects. We had uh, um, so some of our important milestones were a social media campaign on the state of um, wildlife trafficking in the EU and the environmental and social consequences of illegal wildlife trade, as well as a different social media campaign on CITES. Um, you'll learn more on CITES later in case you haven't heard of it before, which was on the occasion of the COP19, so the Conference of Party Parties 19, celebrated in Canada uh, in Panama in November this year, uh, last year. And also we had a reaction letter to the revision of the EU action plan against wildlife trafficking published in November 2022. Um, and then basically, this is obviously also one of our projects, this webinar, um, which will also conclude our work as the illegal wildlife project. Um, so this is basically who we are. Obviously, um, we have, well, yeah, myself and Fatima as the project leads. Then we have a couple of wonderful project officers who do mainly all the work. Um, so they are also responsible for all the great stuff you can see here today. And our awesome biodiversity coordinators, the working group coordinators for biodiversity, um, whom are also present here today. So you'll also hear, um, hear from them later. Um, and now more about this online workshop today. You're probably wondering what you can expect. Um, you'll learn more about illegal wildlife trade, basically what it is, what drives it, what the implications are, and then also what the role of the EU um, is in tackling, tackling wildlife crimes. Um, and then we'll also take a critical end, uh, angle on social media and end on a note about what you can do about illegal wildlife trade and um, how you can report and abuse this online. And now Anna will walk you through today's agenda. Thank you. Uh, warm welcome to everyone again. So uh, tonight's workshop will be divided into four main parts. First, Alice Pasqualato, our first speaker, will be introducing the topic on illegal wildlife trade. She will be focusing on some policy frameworks, specifically in the EU context. After that, our project lead Fatima will be introducing the role of youth in tackling wildlife trafficking. And then our intera interactive session of this workshop will start. It will be divided into two main parts. First off, we'll have Lionel Ashman, who will be talking about cybercrime and how to identify and report suspicious ads of wildlife sales on social media platforms. And secondly, we have Vanessa Moroso, who will be talking about how to identify and report wildlife abuse also on social media platforms. We will be then dedicating some time to you, the audience, to answer any questions you might have. And then we will wrap up this workshop with some conclusive remarks from our project lead, Fatima, as well. Um, 
so So again, just a quick uh, a reminder, we will be using Slido as our platform to address any of your questions. You might uh, scan this QR code on your camera phone and it will be redirect you to our Slido uh, homepage, or you can go to slido.com and insert this code and it will also redirect you to our homepage. Uh, if you wish to address any questions specifically to one of our speakers, please do so by stating their name. And um, also you might ask questions anonymously or you can also state your name. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to address all of your questions, but you can vote for your favorite questions and we will make sure it does, that the most voted questions will be uh, asked by my colleague Lea towards the end of this workshop. So uh, with no further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker of the night, who is Alice Pasqualato. She is a current policy officer at the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime. And Alicia, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, thank you to you, Fatima, uh, Oliver, and all the great people at uh, Generation Climate Europe. I love the work that you're doing. I think everything the Biodiversity Working Group is doing, and especially on the IWT project, is so useful and much needed at a European level, especially when it targets young people. So let me see if we can get started with my presentation. There we go. Okie dokie. I think we're missing a slide. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation just fine? Yes, fantastic. Uh, my camera might be doing weird things, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be uh, all good. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. My name is uh, Alicia or Alice. Um, you, I, my brain really responds to both at this point. So feel free to use both or either. Uh, I'm originally from Venice, Italy, and I'm now based in Vienna, um, where, where um, I came, I believe in 2019, towards the end of 2019, um, after graduating law school uh, from the University of Padua, I wrote my thesis on environmental crime. And so I have an environmental law background. Um, after my time at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in 2020, I started working for the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, and I've been there for about two years. What is the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, or EWC? Uh, we are an international initiative hosted by ADM Capital Foundation, and uh, the initiative was created in June of 2020 with two objectives. One being the promotion uh, of an international agreement against wildlife trafficking, and the other one being promoting a One Health approach to wildlife trade and markets. Now, uh, with the second one, I would have to articulate it uh, a bit further, but uh, I, I, I think it would take too much time. So if you're interested in this, um, I, I would love for you to go and check out our website and learn more about our activities and objectives. Today, we're talking about illegal wildlife trade. Now, you might hear me and others refer to it as IWT, the acronym, or wildlife trafficking. At the UN, at the United Nations level, we call it illicit wildlife trafficking. All of this, or all of these are terms that we use to refer to the same thing. Um, and I wanted to provide you with some form of definition for it. Now, from a legal perspective, there's no universally accepted definition of the term. So I gave you the definition of the EU action plan against wildlife trafficking, and that is international and non-international, so national, illegal trade in wild animals and plants and their, uh, their uh, derivatives. So uh, wildlife products. That means that with this term, we refer to both live and dead animals and their parts. And obviously, uh, the close interlinked offenses such as poaching. Now, uh, IWT is one of the world's top criminal activities ranked alongside drugs trafficking, arms trafficking, human trafficking, and some examples of IWT are well known. I'm sure many of you, even if you're not familiar with the concept of illegal wildlife trade, you will have heard of poaching of elephants for their ivory or poaching of tigers for their skins uh, or teeth and bones. However, there are countless other species that are being illegally exploited and they don't necessarily get a lot of attention from, um, from mainstream media. 
Now, what is CITES? Um, because we're talking about the illegal wildlife trade, I thought it would be important to also say a few words about the legal wildlife trade. And the legal wildlife trade at an international level is regulated by an international instrument referred to as CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. Interestingly enough, this convention is about to turn 50. It will turn 50 on the 3rd of March. Uh, it's a convention from 1973. What this convention does is ensure that uh, international trade in wildlife, wild animals and plants remains as sustainable as possible so that it does not threaten the survival of the species that are internationally traded in the wild. Um, it's uh, trade is regulated through a permit system and permit requirements uh, are different depending on which appendix uh, a species is listed under. So we have appendix one, two and three and appendix one is the one that has the strictest um, requirements. First, uh, poll of the day. So um, GCI, um, GCE actually, had a great idea of keeping this uh, workshop as uh, interactive as possible. So I believe Anna will now start our first poll. And for our first poll of the day, I thought I would ask you uh, to take a wild guess and try and guess what European country reported the most illegal wildlife trade in 2020. Italy, Spain, Netherlands, or Germany. So I believe you're now seeing the poll. I'd be, I'd be curious to see what your responses are. And um, I'll give you the response in just a few minutes. Now, let's see if I can move on to the next slide. Oh, there you go. What are the drivers of the trade? Uh, what drives the illegal wildlife trade? First uh, driver that comes to mind is traditional medicines. Unfortunately, some types of traditional medicine, especially Chinese traditional medicine, can be extremely destructive to wildlife and ecosystems. Um, and the, um, the species that I wanted to mention here, uh, just to give an example, is um, the pangolin. Pangolins are these very shy, cute mammals that you see in the first picture. And they're unfortunately the most trafficked mammals in the world. Up to 200,000 pang 200, pangolins a year are poached for their meat and scales. And the scales are ground and then used in traditional medicine to treat all sorts of ailments, uh, from helping nursing mothers' difficulty with lactation to per circulation arthritis. Uh, although I have to say that Western medicine does not support any of these claims. The second driver that I wanted to mention is food, especially uh, luxury cuisine. Now, for this example, I uh, wanted to talk about sharks, but, and obviously, you know, the shark fin trade is um, an incredible issue worldwide. But uh, earlier uh, this morning, I was reading a, a report by Beastly Business, and they were mentioning uh, an example that's actually very close to us. And that is the wild birds that are caught and legally trapped um, in uh, Cyprus and Italy and Malta. Um, and they're then eaten as uh, these local cuisine delicacies. So unfortunately, uh, we do consume, we do see a lot of illegal wildlife trade related to food consumption in the European Union as well. Um, third, the pet trade. I think uh, we can all think of at least one person in our life, or at least in my experience, it's, it's very easy to think of someone in our life that has parrots. And unfortunately, the high demand for parrots in Europe comes with a lot of uh, demand for also illegally sourced parrots. The demand driving this illicit trade comes from collectors and breeders, but also citizens who just want them as pets. Um, and consumers are often unaware of where their parrots come from, uh, and that's obvious, and that's unfortunately contributing to driving many uh, parrot species to extinction. Last but not least, fashion. And again, I think we can all uh, think of at least a few fashion brands that use real uh, leather and real uh, reptile skin in their products, and that uh, unfortunately, the legal trade in reptile skins often. Um, conceals a lot of illegally sourced products as well. Now, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this presentation is that the European Union is a huge market. It's one of the largest markets for both legal and illegal trade. And that goes for both CITES listed species, so uh, species that are 
listed and protected under that convention that I mentioned earlier on, CITES, but also species that are not protected by CITES. And that's the vast majority of species that unfortunately don't find uh, much protection under international law. So here is the answer to your first poll. Um, Germany was actually the country that reported the, the most um, uh, IWT seizures in 2020 followed by France, Netherlands, Spain, Italy, Denmark, and many others. Now, I do have to say, there you go. Some, some of you, some of you uh, got it right. I think most of you said Italy, and I see why, unfortunately, but it was Germany. Um, but keep in mind that uh, these estimates are based on official seizure reports by European member states. So they only show a part of the picture. These are the, the people that got caught, basically. And so it really depends on the enforcement within the member state as well. Germany has, you know, re fairly good enforcement, um, and especially in uh, the wildlife trade department. And so uh, I would say it's it's fairly normal that they they, they had more seizures than others. Uh, but that's just my, my wild guess, because we do know that Italy and Spain have a, a lot of um, um, IWT. I also wanted to say that this is a, these are numbers from 2020. So do keep that in mind. 2020 is the first year of the pandemic. So they're not numbers that um, are necessarily in line with the numbers that we see from other uh, years. Let's see. If, oh, there we go. What commodities are being seized? Um, now, let me see if I can use my little laser pen here. There you go. You'll notice that the majority of the commodities are actually plant-derived medicinals. Um, but if you look at the animal commodities, uh, it, it, might surprise, uh, it might surprise you that it's mostly reptiles and birds. So I think this is very important because when we talk about um, IWT, when we talk about wildlife trafficking, we often refer to the traffic of um, wild cats or um, uh, rhinos, but the numbers in the European Union tells us that actually it's most the the animals are mostly traded in our region are reptiles live and dead and birds live and dead um then obviously followed by corals mammal body parts and ivory so uh there is a lot of ivory as well but the vast majority is reptiles and birds um and so do keep that in mind um just because numbers can sometimes be a little bit um, dull. I wanted to give you some images of what animals we're talking about. One of the most seized animals in the European Union, actually the most seized live bird species in the EU is the African gray parrot. This species is listed under Appendix 1 of CITES, so it's uh, highly protected under CITES. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't save it from the high demand uh, that we have in our region where a lot of people want these animals as, pe as uh, pets. Um, think about the fact that in Ghana, close to 99% of African gray parrots have disappeared since 1992. So this animal is virtually extinct in Ghana, but also in other regions. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a lot of ivory trade, unfortunately, um, so both African and, um, and Asian elephants. And then we have some of those uh, species that are not as charismatic, they're not as iconic, and so they don't get as much attention. Um, the, this tortoise that I, that I um, mentioned here it was actually the most seized species in terms of the quantity of seizure re records. So there's a lot of trade that goes on for these pieces. And same can be said about sea horses. Um, again, I was reading this uh, basically uh, business report earlier this morning, and they were talking about how these non-charismatic, these non-iconic species just suffer from a lack of attention because we think that the animals that we consider to be more valuable, so big cats, um, elephants, rhinos, those are the animals that get the most attention. Whereas these animals, although they're heavily traded, they don't get um, as much protection and attention. Now, poll number two, uh, because we've been talking about IWT, I would like to I would like to test you and see if you can guess what animal was used 
um, to create these uh, boots that were um, seized because they were being traded illegally. So do you think it's the Nile crocodile, blood python, loggerhead sea turtle, or spectacle caiman? Um, I'll give you the answer at the very end of the presentation. Moving on to the implications of IWT, I know that Vanessa uh, will talk about animal cruelty later on, so I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna discuss that too much. But obviously, uh, animal cruelty is also a big implication. I will focus on um, overexploitation. I think that's pretty obvious. We know that by illegally exploiting some of these species, we're causing them to go extinct in the wild. Ecological costs, again, I think this is fairly easy to understand. There are species that are incredibly important to their ecosystem. And once they're traded in big numbers uh, and disappear from that ecosystem, there are important ecological costs. Um, health risks, I think COVID has taught us that human beings being in close contact uh, with wildlife can lead to very dire consequences because it increases the risk of zoonotic tr transmission. Uh, and several epidemics and pandemics have been caused by these type of zoonosis. Now, threats to other species, um, I'll just mention the fact that if you're trading, especially illegally, um, uh, wildlife species, some of them are unfortunately then released in an environment, in an ecosystem that they're not originally a part of. They're not native to certain ecosystems, and those are considered to be alien species, and that can lead to a lot of harm for native species. And then finally, criminality and human rights violation. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that the European Union um, since 2016 has been working and developing uh, an action plan against wildlife trafficking. The first plan uh, from 2016 had three main priorities, one being better enforcement, uh, enhanced cooperation, and more effective prevention. I'm pleased to say that in November of last year, November 2022, the EU revised his, its action plan and added a fourth priority, and that is one that is very close to the work that we are doing at the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, strengthening the legal and policy framework against wildlife trafficking. That's very important because objective 15 of this action plan uh, actually mentioned that the European Union will promote a new global agreement against wildlife trafficking. And that is something that we have been working on with our partners for uh, over two years now, all three actually. Um, if you would like to learn more about that and why we think it's very important to have a new global agreement against wildlife trafficking, you can visit our website and wildlifecrime.org. And finally, this is the result of poll number two. That uh, those boots were, yeah, I, I'm, I'm now looking at the results and uh, it doesn't surprise me to see that you didn't think it was a sea turtle, but it was, unfortunately. Um, and that, it's, uh, that was illegal trade because all seven species of sea turtles are currently listed under Appendix 1. So their uh, trade is only permitted under very specific circumstances. And that was not one of them. Thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. And thank you again to uh, Generation Climate Europe for putting together this fantastic event. I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for... Um, for giving us this really useful information. Um, quick reminder, if any of you in the audience have a specific question to ask to Alicia, please do so on our Slido channel. And um, well, it is safe to say that these key, to key takeaways were very much enlightening for us, but I hope for the audience as well. I mean, you gave us um, some great insights on the main drivers of illegal wildlife trade. You talked about CITES. And uh, mentioning that the EU market is one of the largest markets in the world for illegal wildlife trade makes this webinar even more important. And um, I mean, we've heard about animal cruelty, uh, overexploitation, the list goes on and on. And we hope that especially the illegal, uh, the EU action plan against illegal wildlife trafficking, uh, like many others, will be part of this change. 
So um, I will now introduce our next speaker. She is one of our amazing project leads um, for this team. Uh, she will be talking about the important role of youth in tackling illegal wildlife trade. So uh, Fatima, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you very much, Alice, for that wonderful introduction to the Legal Wildlife Trade Team. We, GCE, GCE's Legal Wildlife Trade Team, have been doing extensive work, not only to create awareness among European youth of the consequences of wildlife trafficking, but we've ha we have also been advocating uh, to elevate youth voices and perspective when making decisions about it. First is the context. In the last years, illegal wildlife trade movements have been moving from physical markets to online marketplaces. This shift was accelerated due to the pandemic restrictions during the COVID-19. Furthermore, social media platforms are increasingly being used by wildlife traffickers to advertise and sell wildlife, but also wildlife products. And not only this, but we think social media also plays a very relevant role in making uh, publications depicting wildlife animals go viral and therefore creating this sense that sometimes owning exotic species as pets is fun and harmless. If we combine these tendencies with the fact that only in the European Union there are more than 177 million people from the millennial and said generations and that 97% of young Europeans were active on the internet only in 2020, we conclude that youth are the primary consumers of digital portals and therefore may also become potential consumers of these wildlife and wildlife products illegally sourced. And not only that, but we are also, as youth, part of the chain of transmission of wildlife related content on social media, sometimes from suspicious origin. However, we believe there is also a not to be missed opportunity here. And this is the fact that youth can become digital activists against wildlife trafficking. On the one hand, youth can become an active part of the fight against the illegal wildlife trade by detecting and reporting suspicious videos, images, or advertisements to the competent authorities. On the other hand, youth can also become ambassadors against wildlife trafficking by sharing their knowledge and raising awareness about social media best practices among their family, friends, colleagues, and even, even wider digital networks. But to become effective spotters of illegal wildlife trade movements on online platforms, we need knowledge and tools. We need to be able to recognize when an advertisement is selling a wildlife or wildlife product illegally sourced. We need to be able to discern which publications are, shared, are safe to share, like and comment on social media, and which ones are a threat to certain species. And not only that, but we also need to know how to report these publications and advertisement. And that is why we have organized this online workshop. And this is exactly what we hope you are going to be learning in the coming section of this event. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you again uh, for this presentation about the importance of youth and the opportunities that youth has in tackling illegal wildlife trade. Um, if you have any questions specifically for Fatima, please do so and address them to her on our Slido platform. So uh, we will now start with the more interactive part of our webinar, uh, which is going to be divided and hosted between two uh, speakers. Lionel has been working as a program manager for wildlife crime at E4 for quite a while now, and he will be talking about cybercrime and how to identify and report suspicious ads on of uh, wildlife sales on social media platforms. So Lionel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, I hold, uh, thanks for joining. I know some are joining from, and it's very late. I saw some um, participants from India, Nepal, so Vietnam too. So thank you for joining at such a late nights and uh, 
And yes, also thank you to GC for the, this opportunity to talk about this very important subject. And that's also a great pleasure to be able to benefit to the great work that GC is doing overall. Uh, let me start just by presenting me. Um, so I'm French, as you might have heard already or noticed, but I'm based now in the UK. But I wanted to start presenting myself by just telling you a bit more of how I ended up being there. So I, I did engineering as part of my education, but I always wanted to have an impact on the planet, something positive I can bring to the table. And so I ended up changing completely my education, moving to social science, uh, to be able to have the degree, um, or at least the legitimacy to have the opportunity to work in these fields. And at the same time, I took part in some of the climate march, took part uh, with a small role in some of national activist association uh, back in France. Um, and so, yeah, I started like as a volunteer and like I wrote, like I just a young citizen uh, who just wanted to have a positive impact on the planet, especially regarding the environment. and. Um, yeah, from being a volunteer, I then joined IFO as uh, a temporary uh, wildlife campaigner and now I moved on to a different position to be today program manager uh, for the wildlife crime. I basically lead uh, IFO wildlife cyber crime work or what we call by cyber crime is everything linked to the internet uh, that deals with wildlife crime. But I still have the same aspiration every day just to try to have a positive impact and to make a small difference uh, with our work. Um, and I, I did put this picture on the bottom left and that I, I took this one. And I think that's a that's a good example of uh, with this sign of climate change that art used to ignore. And they were properly struggling to carry it. So that was quite uh, funny. Either way, um, you may wonder who is I for, what is I for? And so I, I thought it could be interesting uh, to quickly introduce who we are, what we're doing, and where we come from. So I for stands for International Fund for Animal Welfare. So we're an international NGO that has been uh, created in 1969, so a bit more than 50 years ago. Um, we are offices all over the world in Europe. We are based in the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Germany, France, and we also are based in the UK. I know it's not Europe anymore, but uh, as part of geographical Europe, and then we are all the continents. But basically, our work, we are here to partner with local communities, governments, other NGOs, civil society organizations, the private sector, the general public, basically to fill the gaps uh, that are needed. Um, and to summarize what we're doing, we have a big pillar on saving animals because we believe that each individual animal is important so we have significant work on wildlife rescue whether that's from disaster rescue so for example in lebanon um, uh, during the explosion australia and uh, ukraine right now we have some marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation work we also have some wildlife rescue with um, often elephants uh, rhinos or koalas in australia for example so that's the approach of taking care and trying to rehabilitate and put it back to the one all animals um, or wildlife. And then we also have a pillar on conservation. So instead of considering each uh, animal at the individual level, we look at wildlife as at the population level side. So we are doing some work on marine conservation, landscape conservation. We're engaging with communities on the ground. So you have a picture of the the women in the Maasai community were engaging in Ambo City, South and Kenya. Um, and then we have some wildlife from work, knowing that everything is all related and work all together. And so today, this presentation and my work fits into the wildlife from part. I'm gonna go very quickly through this slide because Alice really presented that very well. So I will save you some time. Yes, I will re-emphasize this one that is key. The EU is a key actor in illegal wildlife trade. Uh, the map below is just regarding ivory, but the EU is key actor for import, transit, and also in terms of consumption. So that's why this webinar is very relevant. And we, it's good that we can escape a bit from this misconception that everything is happening in Southeast Asia or East Asia. But yes, the EU is as a role to play to get better and to disrupt this um, wildlife trafficking. 
And Alice already mentioned the EU wildlife trafficking action plan that was just to mention. Um, a new po policy momentum at the EU level that is also being supported by GC and all the other NGOs that are going in the right direction with recently the new EU ivory regulation that aims basically at banning ivory trade on the, except um, in very specific circumstances. Uh, we have the EU Digital Service Act that have been passed and will be implemented, which aims for all type of crime to make whatever is illegal offline, illegal online. And then the environmental crime directive that is about basically sanctions penalties so that wildlife crime can be considered as a serious crime and therefore have the right sanctions and use the legal system as a deterrent to wildlife crime and the wildlife sufficient action plan that Alice presented. So I won't dive into this detail, but it was more to present to what is the situation right in the EU. Yes, the EU is a key actor in the illegal wild trade, but there are changes that are going to the right direction, including at the political level, at least at the EU level. But what about the honest sphere? And Fatima already talked briefly about that, but I think it's important to, to really see the link between wildlife crime and what I will mention as wildlife cyber crime or wildlife cyber enable crime or other type of wildlife crime linked to, to the internet. That's the same terminology. But basically, um, with the rise uh, of the access of the internet, progress in technology and smartphones, et cetera, and COVID amplified it in that people started spending more and more time on the internet, starting search engine to online platforms, now social media. And the problem with the internet is that it represents unprecedented obstacles for law enforcement, because that's a market that is open 24 seven. Now you have translator tool. So basically you can reach out to whoever you want in the plant, even though you don't speak their language. And you have a sense of, uh, you can use pseudonyms basically to try to hide yourself. So it's much more difficult for people to, to uh, identify you. So you, this sense of anonymity will also push for having more actors, while traffickers spending time on the internet. And also you have so many new adverts every day on new listing that is very difficult to be able to filter that basically or control what's going on. And the last thing, and Alice already mentioned that that's an organized crime issue. So that means it requires much more energy strategy um, better suited approach to be able to tackle it. Um, and the goal is to disrupt the networks, which will have more impact, uh, at least so far. So what is also important to know, so we had the shift from only physical, while well, from happening on physical marketplace to physical marketplace and online. And like Fatima said, whether to sell adverts, uh, so to sell wildlife products or live animal to advertise them to create your customer base, whether it is, it is for to coordinate, uh, to find new people to join the network. Um, internet is being key, and this is one of the elements that will even be in every wildlife crime case now because you will always have a WhatsApp conversation at some point. And what is important to acknowledge too, even if we look only at the parts of selling wildlife products or live animal online, that's, it represents millions of live animal and products every year. And that's just an estimation. We, in fact, we don't really know how big that is. That might be a billion, um, but it's at least millions of products. And it goes from, for example, ivory, rhino, but also big cats, primates, reptiles, parrots, and everything that uh, Alice mentioned earlier. Um, and you might ask, okay, what can we find in the EU? Because like I said, the EU is one of the big actors um, and Alice already started to develop a bit of what can we find in terms of water from in the EU. And so let me walk through a research we did, a very small research we did um, pre-COVID, um, but the, the results we have post-COVID are pretty much the same. And just to show you 
what we can actually find online, which in fact is very similar to what Alice presented you. So we find a lot of birds, exotic birds, birds of prey, a lot of reptiles, whether tortoises, turtles, snakes, lizards, but also some ivory. And something that you need to keep in mind is the number you can see on this um, table. It's the number of adverse flags. So we flags over 3,000 adverts in a couple of weeks. But one advert could be six or 20 tortoises. So the number is so much bigger, especially when you talk about live specimens usually. And that's the case for tortoises. They will sell more than just one. And uh, on the right, just the illustration, that's a gray parrot. So the species that Alice presented you uh, that have been blocked by a website we're working with. Um, and so blocked before it joined, um, it has landed in the platform. So that's part of the work the online platform are doing. But just to give you an example of a typical adverts you can find online, which is Species that is protected, completely legal to sell online. And so that was in French, in France, in one of the biggest French marketplaces. I will let you breathe a little bit because I might talk maybe a bit fast, and that's a lot of information. And I know it's supposed to be an interactive part. So I would like to ask you one question. Consider that our Imagine that you are a wildlife researcher and you need to find an ivory advert or you are looking for ivory adverts on a specific website. Let's take an online marketplace, for example, which has different categories, like a general online marketplace, for example, eBay. Um, my question is, which categories would you check for ivory items? And if that's fine, because it's, it might be either like that. I would invite you to answer or to put some suggestion in the chat so that we can think about that. So consider a general online marketplace in English. Um, which categories would you check to find ivory items? So I would give you a couple of seconds, then I will keep moving and, and I will come back to that later. Okay, I've started seeing some interesting um, answer. So I will come back to that um, later on, but basically you already starting to, when you read all the message to pinpoint one important thing is that you can find ivory in different categories, which means the effort that are needed to filter ivory or to find ivory is much more difficult than going to the ivory section. And most of the categories you said are right, in fact. So we're done. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about what is the problem, why we're here today, but I wanted to give you also some hope because that's important to know what's going on. Uh, I quickly mentioned what's going on at the EU policy level, but I would also like to share with you some solution or some current effort that being taken and also the impacts of that. So I We'll start by presenting you the approach that IFO is doing on wildlife cybercrime. Um, and so we basically, in most continents, but we have a big focus in Europe doing some research to then be able to understand the trends and to be able to share it to the right stakeholders. For example, policymakers, we can say, we find that many ivory and we find more and more ivory. Therefore, you need to put more effort into ivory and in our advocacy work then. The, the research will also feed the support we're doing to law enforcement, whether they're sharing intelligence with them, whether they're sharing, that also supporting them by delivering training, um, giving them more equipment to deal uh, with wildlife crime. We're also working with the general public um, 
And pretty much like what JC is doing, the goal is to raise awareness. And then the ultimate goal would be to reduce the demand because by reducing the demand, you will also uh, red make it harder to, um, to sell ivory for the trafficker. So reducing demand is one of the key elements. And the last thing we're doing is we're partnering with online tech companies. And that comes to the question I was asking earlier. Because it's so difficult to filter or to have a clean website, we are working with them to help them with that, to make sure they have the, poly, the right policy in place, to have the right tool, the right skill set to be able to have a clean website. Um, so that's why that this is one of our pillars to be able to work with them, to provide them assistance, also to give them the right information because most of the private sector wants to do better. They just don't have the right tools, don't have the right incentives. So we've been working um, for a long time with online platforms, but in 2018, we created an on-site traffic and WDF, what is being called as the coalition to enwala trafficking online. The goal is really to create a place where companies, social media, online marketplace, um, and any other relevant companies basically can have a space where they can collaborate and try to solve problems together. And alongside that, we are helping them to have strong policy, broader policy, but also to have the, the expertise to moderate that and to implement their policy, to enforce the policy. We're also doing some user education. We have a program that is called the Cyber Spotter uh, that we can talk later if you want. And we're also pushing them to do more AI work uh, to be able to filter. So the goal is really to have them have a clean website so that while a trafficker cannot advertise on their platforms, or at least it will become very difficult for them to do so. And here are some results. So right now we have around 46 companies that are partners. Uh, the one you might know is. Etsy, eBay, uh, Meta is there, Instagram, TikTok, etc. Just so that you keep that in mind, this is not a legally binding coalition. And so we are also engaging with the platforms and our impacts also depends on how much effort the platforms is doing. So that's why some results may, may differ from one to another. And in, in four years, we, so the platforms that are a member of the coalition, we moved our block more than 11 million of listings. So what I'm saying with that, that's a lot, but the problem is that we don't really know what is the, the baseline. If it's 11 million out of 10 billion of adverts that are being advertised, or is it 11 million out of 100 million? So it's difficult to know how much impact it has. What we know is that we do have an impact and it also showcases and reemphasizes the size of the problem of what's going on online, um, knowing again that one listing could have 10 tortoises. So just show the scale of the problem we're dealing with and therefore the need to work with all the stakeholders with the holistic approach. I had an example, but I'm a bit short on time. Um, so I will skip that, uh, can come back later or uh, you can find some information about that on our website, I believe. Uh, but please feel free to ask questions. And so I presented you and the pre previous speaker also talked about what was the problem, what are the current efforts. Um, and I can tell you progress in made, is being made. We still have a long way to go, uh, but you may wonder uh, what roles can you play also to support these fights. And I think that was one of the subjects that, um, that's why this webinar does exist. So let me tell you a bit or uh, give you some ideas of how you can help district wildlife cybercrime while still remaining uh, on the, in legality and that you don't have any problem regarding data compliance, GDPR, et cetera, because that's not the goal. So I think the first, a recommendation we have for you is to stay informed, to ask questions, to be aware. And you being already there during this webinar is already a good step forward. Like Fatima mentioned, you can play a role to be a, an ambassador, to raise awareness within your inner circle, to talk to people why, what is the problem behind 
having, I don't know, liking a post on Paros, et cetera. And what is going with online wildlife crime, but also wildlife crime, illegal wildlife trade, and also animal cruelty. And that's what Vanessa will present it after. Then the real question is, okay, if you encounter listings that promotes or display wildlife cyber crime elements or wildlife fraud elements, what is the best thing you can do? First, don't watch the video because, so on YouTube, for example, that's after 30 seconds in count as a view, but on any other social media, if you watch it a bit, that will feed the algorithm and give it more visibility. The goal is really to have this video or this type of video the less visible possible. Same, so do not like and do not share the listing. Also, we would recommend to report the post or account on the platforms. I did put wisely because we don't want to create a big wave of everything, um, a video that being reported that doesn't properly display its wildlife crime elements. So that's why we put wisely, just to make sure that everything is being reported is really um, illegal so that it will help the platforms. And we encourage people to report because then it will, be, it will feed the algorithm uh, and we also have the security team of all the platforms to get better at that. And the last thing is uh, you can embrace this fight as part of the career path, whether you work in NGOs, whether you work in companies, whether you work in governments, you may always, at least in some situation, find a way where you can advocate for protecting biodiversity better to inform, uh, to change the CSR policy, to include wildlife trafficking as part of that. So you may have also some qualities as part of your private life to, to help doing that. I've been talking about that. I know I'm a bit late, but I'm gonna be quicker, but that's good. I've been uh, telling you when you're on a listing, but you may ask, okay, but how do I want to enter a listing and how do I find it? So I will give you a few keys on how to identify illegal contents. Obviously that isn't, that it isn't exhaustive. That's more just some keys. And that we also come with practice and also by curiosity. So how can you identify species? You can identify um, species just using the information that was sometimes it might be wrong. Uh, so always double check using search engine. So if, this, if on the adverts they say it's a gray parrot, go on Google or Baidu or whatever, uh, and then search for gray parrot, and then you can compare the two image and check whether that's the right, um, that's indeed coherence with what is being said. Uh, you can also refer to existing training material and guides are being uh, provided by expert organization and that are on open access. Um, I can dive into that a bit later. And also you have some websites, for example, speciesplus.net, that is when you enter the name that would give you the uh, levels of protections of the species depending on the origin, the place, et cetera. And that's a very good website to, to know whether that's legal or illegal. Sorry. Um, you can also use, uh, there is a few things that are important or that can give you some red flags to identify whether the adverse in, is compliant with the law or not. If you start seeing some adverts that use code words, if you have adverts where they, have, they are supposed to give documentation, but you don't see any documentation, you might have some adverts where they completely lower the price for something that is supposed to be very expensive. Um, and you would have the same reflex with, I don't know, fashion or watch. If you get a Rolex for like 10, 10 euros, you might think it might be a scam or something that is really not. Um, I mean, that's not the real one. Um, and like I said, you might have also, that's important to keep in mind, there are a lot of scams. So it's also important to be able to identify them so that you're not reporting scams. Um, so you might, I mean, you're aware of how to the poorly written adverts at the same when you receive emails, etc. Uh, also, you have miss, uh, like I said, with the Rolex example, the price that doesn't reflect the reality. Uh, also, the weight, for example, if they say if they are advertising for ivory, which is a material that is quite heavy, and you can find probably some estimation online or on the guides, and they 
put a weight that is either 10 kgs for like a very small pieces of ivory or just three grams, that might give you an indication. And same with the price. So you have a few tips again, that is not exhaustive, um, but just to keep that in mind when you're doing, if you want to search or if you are facing some adverse. And again, I will just finish um, on the same slide of what are some guidance of what you can do. Also, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are always happy to answer, to grab the phone in case you, you want to have. I mean, I've been lucky enough in my career to, when I was a student, to reach out to people, they answered to me. So I, I try to do the same, depending on how much time I have, obviously. Um, but I hope it did interest you. And also, I'm looking forward to answer any question you might have uh, in the Q&A. And I'm sorry I run a bit late. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. I mean, uh, you mentioned some problems due to social media platforms like anonymity, unregulated, unlimited social medias. But it's also good to know that there are some tangible solutions. And um, I mean, not only do we confide in policymakers, but it's good to know that we as individuals can also be part of the solution. And I think we all agree uh, that even by being informed or raising awareness, uh, um, towards illegal wildlife trade uh, can be a step closer to finding a path towards one solution or more solutions. Uh, yes, so um, if you see in the chat, Fatima has been posting the link to our Slido homepage. You can add the code to that and you will be redirected to our Q&A session, which will, will, be ha which will um, happen shortly. But uh, for now, I will uh, introduce our last speaker of the session, which is going to be Vanessa. Vanessa is the head of Wild Animals in Trade at Four Paws, and uh, she will be focusing especially on wildlife abuse. So she will be showing us pictures and videos of wildlife abuse and how to identify and report that. So yes, Vanessa, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Oops. Thank you, Anna. Here we go. Unmute myself. I'll just share my screen. One second. Yes, I think you just have to put it in presentation mode and we're good. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks again. And um, really, really great presentations from Oliver, Alice, Fatima and Lionel. Um, thank you also uh, to the audience here today. And thank you for having me. Um, it really is an honor to speak to you today. Um, thank you to GCE uh, for the invitation. So today I will be speaking to you about introducing the role of youth as cyber spotters. But I will tell you a little bit about me as well. Um, so my name is Vanessa Amoroso. Um, I've been employed at Four Paws International since September 2021. And I've been in the animal welfare sector for about 11 years. Uh, previously to that, I worked at World Animal Protection and the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, at university, I studied environmental biology, and then I did a postgraduate certificate in international animal welfare, ethics and law. Um, so currently, I, I oversee uh, the design and the delivery of our commercial big cap trade campaigns um, in South Africa, and then also the European trade of tigers. I also head up the wildlife trade component of pandemics and animal welfare campaign. Um, and I live in Scotland with my wife and two dogs. Here they are. So that's Fig and Tofu. Um, big shout out to them. And uh, in my spare time, I like to go wild dolphin watching at the beach and eating vegan burgers often at the same time. OK, so today, what are we going to speak about? Um, so in order to be a cyber spotter, I think it's good to get a good basis on what animal welfare is. Um, once we've established that, we can understand that wildlife abuse uh, takes many forms, and then we can understand, uh, go to identify wildlife, wildlife abuse online. We'll be looking at the role of social media as a catalyst, and then we'll have a little interactive turn 
uh, session with you when you can put in your answers in the chat. And then once we've learned what to look out for, how can we report it, which has uh, been covered already, but I will re refresh that as well. And then a little bonus slide on what can we do in the real world outside of our smartphones. Um, also looking ahead, so what does the future look like? And of course, I'll be taking part in a question and answers session after that. So animal welfare, and you could totally have a completely different webinar on animal welfare, but I've tried to condense it to two slides. Um, so animal welfare is a complex subject with scientific, ethical, economic, cultural, social, religious, and political dimensions, but without an internationally agreed definition. Um, just for your information, in the EU, the definition differs even between European countries. But for the moment, Article 13 of the Lisbon Treaty states that the Union and the member states shall, since animals are sentient beings, pay full regard to the animal welfare requirements of those animals. And that the EU rules on animal welfare reflect the so-called five freedoms. This means that member states must pay due regard to the welfare requirements of animals when preparing and implementing EU policies. Um, so. Uh, you know, uh, member states can go beyond those requirements. They can offer more protection um, in their jurisdictions and those cover um, aspects um, that aren't covered necessarily by the EU, um, for example, stray animals. Um, but yeah, so they can define what they, what they can within themselves independently. But taking all of that into consideration, for cause, uh, then knows that animal welfare is an individual and subjective mental state. It is the sum of all mental experiences of an individual at a given time. This mental state is an experience itself influenced by the interplay between these factors, crucial factors. So a quality of an animal's nutrition, the physical environment, its health status, and its behavioral interactions. <clears throat> so taking all of these into account, uh, the five domains model was developed, and I will show you that. So um, I mentioned the five freedoms. That kind of concentrated on more of a negative outlook, so what not to do. The five domains was is an involvement of what we should be looking for, what we should be doing. So in summary, these are the, the factors. So we have nutrition, physical environment, health, and behavioral interactions. And of course, those can be within the environment with other animals and then also with humans. All of those feed into the mental state and that mental state becomes the welfare state. And of course, that is a negative or a positive experience. So you're animal welfare experts, by the way, now. <laughs> so wildlife abuse can take many forms. The term animal abuse could be described as any action directed at an animal that inflicts pain, psychological or physical harm, suffering or even humiliation. So just so you know, um, mental torture can include but isn't limited to isolation, um, including solitary confinement, um, debilitation, so lack of food, water and sleep deprivation, and then also extreme temperatures. Um, there isn't, again, an agreed definition on animal abuse or wildlife abuse. Um, and then jurisdictions usually include a range of sanctions that vary depending on the animals and or the area in which the situation occurs, which unfortunately often leads to gaps in the protection of animals from abuse. So it, it is important to consider an animal's welfare and learn to recognize suffering, whether physical or mental, or in illegal and legal systems. So how can we identify wildlife abuse online? It's not always overt cruelty. Um, so things like real violence, beating, chaining, treat, not treating wounds. There are also more subtle forms of abuse, which can cause significant stress and long-term repercussions. So I just invite you to have a look at these examples here. <clears throat> these are commonly found online on social media. So we have a guy in the jungle cuddling a sloth. We have a bush baby 
being fed something in somebody's home. And then we also have a small, a young juvenile tiger, probably only a few months old in somebody's house. So how can we identify abuse online? So online content is likely to be exploitative if it shows wild animals living in any environment outside of their natural habitats, other than of course, legitimate rescues and rehabilitation centers. They can be separated from their own species, especially if infants are, are separated from their mothers. And then interacting with species other than their own, especially humans, or exhibiting unnatural behaviors, such as wearing clothes or performing tricks. So I've got a couple of videos to show you. Hopefully the sound works, but uh, don't worry, it's the pictures that's more important. Uh, here. <laughs> I'm not sure if you heard the sound, but in the tiger video, uh, this lady is taunting this very distressed tiger um, with maybe a broom or something. And yeah, it's quite humiliating and causing stress. The animal's clearly trying to get away. Um, and here, a scene from the jungle, um, forcibly separating mother and baby for photos. Um, again, I'm sorry if, it, if you found it a little bit distressing. <clears throat> okay, so um, social media as a castle for wild animal abuse, so, uh, and also more. Um, so animal posts on social media may seem harmless and fun, but, it, but they are extremely harmful. Every click, view, comment, and share and reaction contributes to, and this list is long, um, animal cruelty and abuse, as we've just seen, um, proliferation of trade, illegal wildlife trade, decline of species in the wild, public safety hazards, public health concerns, decline of native species by exotic animal releases and escapes, and threats to ecosystems, not to mention at the main influence these people get from benefiting from this exploitation. The, taking into consideration the public safety, that there's also like a big cat right now on the loose in Spain. It's, it still can't be found. And there are also two recent tiger escapes in South Africa, which hit the news. You might have seen that. Um, and also the, uh, the illegal wildlife trade. Um, back in the day when I worked for World Animal Protection, we, through investigations, we uncovered that the otters um, in otter cafes in Japan um, were actually coming from the wild. Their parents were killed and the babies were traded, um, which is obviously terrible and something you don't know and obviously something that's not advertised. Um, so if you just have a look at this photo here, there's this like guy in a pool with, with a white tiger, seems to be cool. Um, when you look at the comments, it's a lot of appreciation, a lot of aspiration as well. Um, unfortunately, that leads to, oh, you know what, I want one too. And guess what? You can find one online. It's cheap enough. Um, there are adverts for white tigers all over Europe. Okay, so here's the interactive session. Um, so given everything that we've learned just now, um, put in the chat what you see is wrong in each of these pictures. And I'll try and look at the chat at this time.
want to look at the chat. Uh, maybe somebody from GCE can read out some answers. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, so here we have one answer from Antonia stating the animals are in contact with humans. Mm -hmm. Clementine is stating interacting with domestic species. Mm -hmm. Leonie is saying, I know that Lor Loris put their arms up as a self-defense. Mm -hmm. Uh, animals shouldn't be in those households. Ingrid is saying everything is wrong. Leader, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, these are not pet animals. Enrica, wild animals as pets. I mean, the list goes on and on. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> the wild species are in a home environment close to humans, putting wild animals in human houses, animals kept in human in houses of humans from Arkadeb. Nailed it. Thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, also to add, yeah, so we have um, species interacting with animals that they wouldn't normally interact as well. And also this one was tricky, obesity. Um, that's the caracal in the middle. So you can also, you can have a lack of nutrition and also too much nutrition. Um, so yeah, that's a very obese big cat. Um, same again for this, this slide, please. So Clementine has just written that uh, they're eating human food. And Tess writes, wild animals that are interacting and eating humans' products. Mm -hmm. Antonia is stating hedge hedgehogs are actually scared of, of the water. Leonie is stating interaction with potential dangerous animals. Fatima is saying that they're being bathed and Arkadab is stating wild animals are not pets. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, and just to add the, clo the clothing as well. Um, and here we have the alligator. That's a, an emotional support animal in the airport. Um, we live in a very weird, weird world right now where that's allowed and normal. Um, and also a, a tough one here with the owl. Um, owls are nocturnal. So um, I think it's very unnatural behavior for it to be well, riding a train, but also in the daylight. Um, so well done, everyone. Thank you. OK, so um, so how can we report wildlife abuse online? Um, I want to highlight a report um, by Asia for Animals. Um, so they organize a coalition called Social Media Animal Cruelty Coalition. Um, and Four Paws is also partners of that. Um, so social media platforms are failing to remove abusive content right now, um, despite it breaching their own policies and community guidelines, even when reported to them. So this report actually stated that, I mean, it's a report on exotic pets online, um, that 840 social media posts showing at least 97 different species. <clears throat> um, these posts were viewed millions of times, so 11.8 million times. Um, up to 65% of the animals depicted were endangered species, such as long-tailed macaques, tigers, and orangutans, and that's a little macaque right there in the picture. Um, primates were featured in the greatest number of posts, so 76%. Um, wild felids, so tigers and other wild animals, wild cats, sorry, were featured in 8%, and reptiles and amphibians in 2.6%. And then most videos... 13% showed animals being psychologically tortured, being used as human entertainers or being physically tortured. Um, I just also wanted to highlight a recent craze that happened only last year, which was people uh, deliberately putting animals, wild animals, um, into dangerous uh, situations. So like tying a monkey or a dog to a train track and then rescuing it, rescuing it just in time before the train comes all for social media, all for that video, all for the likes. And that is so worrying. Okay, so five steps to tackle this cruel content. Um, we've touched on it previously, but the first thing is to be aware and then also make your friends and family aware as well. 
Next, you can report them. So usually each, each, function, each um, post has a function where you can report dangerous content. Um, also try not to watch them um, because it just in increases the algorithm. Um, it, the, same, the same way with do not engage, uh, even if you write this is wrong or, or, or have a dislike option, um, it still pushes up that, that engagement and therefore reaching a wider audience, which is exactly what we don't want. And of course, never, uh, never share the, the same content either. Here's the bonus round. So, okay, what can we do outside of our smartphones and in the real world? Um, so it's not just online, it's also, you can also be responsible offline too. So um, don't, go, uh, go, don't go and take selfies or walks or rides with any animals. Don't visit uh, venues where you can feed the animals or watch them perform tricks um, or buy souvenirs um, made from animal parts. Often the animals are killed for these and don't book any animal interactions. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. What can you do? Let's look at it positively. So what can we do? It's visit true sanctuaries where animals are not bred, sold on, or used for interactions. Um, try and visit wild animals in the wild and give them space when in their environment. Oh, also, sorry, um, there's a little um, travel kind guide. Um, it should be in the chat, but please do have a look. Uh, next time you're booking your holiday, um, make the right choice. Okay, so what does the future look like? Um, how would a world with no wildlife abuse see, seem? So people would uh, know how to spot cruelty and no longer perpetuate likes and acceptability of online content involving animal abuse. They won't like, donate, or visit facilities that offer and promote interactions with wild animals and promote, sorry, and people will make more responsible and better informed choices in their day-to-day -day lives, both online and offline. But it's not just us, it's also the social media platforms. So hopefully, as Lionel uh, stated with his work, so they, they will commit to stamping out wildlife abuse posts found on their sites, whether in private or public groups. And hopefully one day, AI becomes advanced enough to screen cruel content and stop the posts from ever being uploaded and shared. And that's it. So thank you so much. There's a little information about 4.4s as well, if you're interested. And I think we're handing over to the question and answer now. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. I mean, thank you again for mentioning animal welfare in its multifaceted ways. And I mean, it's not always obvious when we scroll through social media platforms that we're looking at an abused animal, but showing us those videos, I mean, I might just speak for myself, but I hope not, uh, has for sure changed the way we approach these things now, not just as an active user, but as a passive user as well. And uh, yes, thank you again very much. And um, we've reached an end to our workshop now. Um, I will pass now the floor to my colleague, Leah, who will be reading out loud some of the questions you've been asked, you've been asking during this workshop. So um, if you want to still uh, ask any questions, you can still go on Slido and do so. Uh, but yes, um, in the meantime, uh, Leah, you can go on. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, thank you, everyone, also for joining uh, the Q and A session now. Uh, so we, as we are running a bit uh, out of time, uh, I think we are only going to ask the three for first question, but we'll see if we can add some more. Um, so as a first question, and the most voted one, uh, it's directed to all speakers, so feel free uh, to pop in if you want to answer. Uh, the first one is, uh, how can we further engage with your work and or become active reporters of suspicious publication? So yeah, feel free to pop in if you want to answer. I can start. Um... No, thanks. Uh, first, it's, it's great to see some enthusiasm like that. Uh, I think the easiest and would be to directly reach out to us. So I can talk for I4, you have my email, I can just put it in the chat box. Um, and then depending on 
the availability and also the capacity that we have, we may sometimes we work with volunteer. Just keep in mind that it's also very dependent on um, the capacity we have. Um, but it's mm -hmm. that that's the first option to just reach out to us or send us some information when you can. And then obviously, I think that would be the same for all uh, the three of us to the basic followers on social media, etc. But just to get and to be aware of what we're doing to reshare maybe the messaging that you agree with amongst other three organizations. And also, if you want to direct your career toward that, just you're very welcome. Feel free to come also to ask any question uh, how we ended up here. Um, I think we have three different education and we are pretty much at the same place. Uh, so that would be my answer. I can go next. Um, just adding, adding onto that. I'm a big believer in people power. Um, so, you know, as you know, we've learned a lot today um, and we, we hopefully know what to do. And the best thing is to really reach out into our networks and make sure that they know as well and spread the word. Um, because these animals are literally suffering for our entertainment, for our, our consumerism, and um, we can change that. We can change that with this generation. Thank you, Vanessa. And I, I, I didn't, I didn't get the chance to say that, but I really wanted to congratulate you both on your presentations because they were excellent. Um, we unfortunately, as the Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime, don't really do public engagement. So there's not really an opportunity to actively engage with our work. We mostly work with governments on our uh, partners. But uh, I would follow Vanessa's lead and say that you don't necessarily need to engage with one of our NGOs or organizations to make a contribution. I think we all have a platform, we all have social media, we all have family and friends. And if you just uh, use that platform, you'll be, you'll be amazed to see how many people are willing to listen. I think most times we don't wanna be the person that you know shares the animal cruelty on their stories or the bad news, the sad news. But if we do become that person, then we're really helping these, uh, these animals and uh, making a meaningful contribution. Okay, thank you all for your answers. Um, so I will take the second one, which is uh, to Lionel. So do you think uh, like social media companies understand the scale of the problem and uh, that they do enough? If not, what can we do to ensure they act? Thanks. And no, very good question. I would try to answer by not generalizing the answer. Obviously, you have good and bad actors everywhere. Are they doing enough? No. <laughs> because we do find some content there. Um, I think we need to take a step back regarding that. Remember, they are companies, so they are working in terms of profits, in terms of costs, and they still want to be profitable company. So the way we can change that is obviously we can work with them, at least that's the approach that I for decided to, to to work with them to push them from inside, but we are not a legal entity. We cannot force them to move. So with some platforms, it's working very well and they are doing much progress, a lot of progress, but it takes time. So we need to be patient. With other, it works not as well. So that's why we need to use other tools to be able to push them. Legal tools are great because they are legally binding. So legal tools with the, for example, the EU Digital Services Act will force obliged platforms to put more resources to deal with this problem. So it comes back to a question of profit costs and how much resources they're putting into um, filtering and cleaning their websites. Um, we also need to keep in mind why that crime is a problem on their platforms. They also have human trafficking, weapons trafficking, uh, pedopornography. They have all types of crime that you can imagine, um, live stream of people getting killed, etc. So that's why also we have a duty to push the agenda of why the firm higher on the priority list. It comes with legal also uh, work, but also civil society and pressure from the general public. That's a role that you can play, that we can both play to write this agenda so that they can put more resources to that. And then with more resources and time and the right expertise, they will be able to deal with this problem. And on the other angle, what is key is also to reduce the demand. Because if no one will by any species, no one would put any adverse online. Um, 
So we also work to work both where reduce the offer by working with the companies or trying ways to have the companies do more effort and also reduce the offer, uh, the demand. I hope it's been on to some point, but yeah, it's not perfect. I mean, I wish it was, but. Thank you, Dalimel, for your answer. Um, so I will take now also the third question, which, which is also uh, an open floor, so anyone can answer. Um, so it is how to collect information on behaviors of pet wildlife keepers on the internet, say on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. So feel free to pop in. I, I can go in with this one. Um, I think I think through all the investigations and research that I've done over the years, what's really apparent is that um, these are animal lovers. Um, people who have animals, tigers, monkeys, they love animals. Um, and so they're just maybe not aware of the suffering that they're causing or even the back trade routes that happen in order to get that animal to to you. Um, so I think if we if we um, approach things with compassion, um, and uh, a solutions focused as well, not demonizing anyone, but raising awareness, um, increasing our education, then that's the most important thing. I would also add a component that I think we should all remember. Um, we're not law enforcement. We have uh, rights and we also need to comply to the law and in Europe. Uh, there is quite strict data compliance and regulation law. So you also need to be aware to not put yourself in danger because you want to uh, report or collect information about uh, pet keepers. So just be mindful of that. We don't want you to end up being sued or because you went a bit too far. Uh, so that's where just be mindful about that. But yeah, I agree with the fact that unfortunately they are animal lovers in a different type of love, let's say. Um, but yeah, reporting is is a way forward. That's not the solution, obviously, not just the solution. But there 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 are work that people working in the background, uh, law enforcement investigator that are doing the work uh, also, and that's their job. So um, yeah, voting also it's something very important. I think we haven't mentioned today, but giving voting is important to have the right politician that will allocate the right resources, the right messaging for animal welfare, also wider crime. Uh, that's something as a citizen we can do to, to really support that, including at the European stage. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think I'm moving away from the question a little bit, but just following uh, up on Lionel's um, comment on law enforcement, I would say we also have to acknowledge that in many occasions, law enforcement does not really respond or does not respond the way they should. And so that can be an issue. I certainly know that it's an issue of my country in Italy, but um, I think the, the same can be said about other countries as well, unfortunately. Um, my advice would be to keep trying. Sometimes you just find the wrong person, the person who doesn't really care about um, wildlife, who doesn't think that you know wildlife is necessarily a law enforcement priority. So keep trying, keep trying to make that call. You might find a colleague that's more interested than other. Um, and if the provincial or regional authority that you reached out to is not necessarily interested or available, do try and go somewhere else. Um, I think we always have to think about the fact that, um, you know, regardless of uh, whether it's um, a, a criminal activity or not, when we look at the welfare of these animals, we are really the only option they have. If we don't report, if we don't act, there's literally no one else that will, because these are things that we see and maybe other people don't. And so, um, I, I think uh, sometimes when you do find that obstacle in front of law, law enforcement, uh, just keep trying. And that's an advice, again, for, mainly for the people that come from my country. I know how frustrating that can be. So, yeah. Okay, thank you all for your answers. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, we have to, uh, yeah, um, finish the session because we're running out of time. But um, yeah, I mean, there's also a lot of interesting questions that were asked. Uh, maybe we can see what we do with it after. Um, so we thank you also for your questions. Um, and I will now give the floor to Fatima for some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Leah. Thank you very much, everyone. 
Taking into account that we are running a little bit late, I wanted to make some conclusions, but I think Anna has already been making really good, nice ones after the speakers, but I would like to highlight the blue square you see at the end. And I think that maybe you can relate sometimes us as you feel paralyzed because of the size of these global challenges we are facing, could be legal wallet trade, could be climate change, could be biodiversity loss. Uh, but we really hope from GCE's team that after this online workshop, you feel a little bit more empowered to contribute to the fight against wildlife trafficking one post at a time. And just to finish, because I really like the acknowledgement part, uh, I would like to thank, uh, to give a big, really big thank you to all the Legal Wildlife Trade team for their efforts and their hard work over the last year. Despite this all being organized and done on a voluntary, on a voluntary basis, you have been a dream team. I would also like to say Big, big thank you to the speakers, Alice, Lionel, Vanessa, for agreeing to participate in today's event and for being brilliant young voices leading the fight against wildlife trade. And of course, thank to all of you who are attending this session live, but also to all of you who have registered to this event and could make it. We never expected such a great reception of this humble online workshop, but we now feel fulfilled as a team that you are equipped with some knowledge and tools needed to face this challenge together. Please do spread the word within your networks. It's been a pleasure to have you all here. Stay tuned. We will be sending a post event email with any resources the speakers would like to share and also the recording of this session. Thank you very much.